you know, I think the autonomy piece is huge. And, you know, when we don't have autonomy, when we feel like we're being pushed around or the things we're doing are a chain of have tos every day, and nobody can really be well if that's dominating their life. So all of us have to find those areas of life where we're doing something that we really value or find interest in. Life is all about relationships. Lovers, family, body, or money. How satisfied you are can be completely explained by how you relate to things around you. This is Sophie Jaffe, and together with my husband, Dr. D. Jaffe, we are here to explore and teach you how to maximize your relationships and achieve a happier life. Let's get ignited. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Ignited Relationships Podcast. I'm Adi Jaffe. And I'm Sophie Jaffe. And we are coming to you today with Man, like expertise on how to build the life you want. Uh, I'm really, really excited for you all to listen to an interview I did with Dr. Ryan, who is one of the originators of something called the self-determination theory. We're going to talk about it a lot. Um, before we dive into this beautiful little intro, we should we should do our thing, right? Okay, let me look around. Can you find the drums? Oh, what? here's the drum. Okay. Oh. I love how you play those drums, baby. Um, open up. Leaning and Heal Yourself by Shay Starr. I've just recently started listening to this podcast, but it has in the last two weeks become the only podcast I listen to. Damn. Mm. I have been searching for a way to change myself and my life, and this podcast is it. That was all caps. I didn't want to yell at you all. Sophie and Adir are so open and so honest and so transparent about their life and struggles, and with all the amazing guests, you can't help but feel ignited. So thank you, Adi and Sophie, for taking my hand and pulling me in and showing me how to lean in and heal myself. I love you guys. Mm. Thank you, Shay. That's awesome. Um, That is so beautiful. Yeah, so great. Remember to DM us or email us. Find a way to contact us for your special package, your love package from us um, for leaving a review and getting it read on the air. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And again, you know this, but keep leaving reviews because we love hearing them. Yep. Well, we love hearing them and it helps us do better and be better and give you more of what you want, which is the point is that this is a community. Yes. And we love you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the quote for today, it's on reflection. It's one of my favorites by Ram Das. What you meet in another being is the projection of your own evolution. Mm-hmm. What you meet in another being is the projection of your own evolution. It's going to take me a second to process. It's deep. If that's not reflection, I don't know what is. Like we, because we, we talk about this a lot. Like Marianne Williamson taught me this concept. It's something that you can feel, but we are presented an opportunity for growth every time we come into a new relationship with someone. Yeah. So wherever you meet someone, if if everyone in the life life that you meet for partnership, for relationships, in work, if it's if every single person is a is a lesson and a mirror of a reflection of where you're at, then it makes sense. It's a reflection of your own evolution. The person that you meet next is a reflection of where you're at on your path. Yeah. Spiritually. That that also, by the way, mentioned that if you're starting to meet people that feel like you're regressing and going back. Out of integrity. Like this doesn't feel right. You yourself a little bit. Yeah. If you start like attracting people in your life and they're all talking shit about each other, like you might want to reevaluate those new friends. You might want to reevaluate your own energy and if it's getting a little sloppy. You know what I love about that in the context of this interview was I come from academia. My whole life, it was always about kind of like appreciating the the professors and the people who study and really, you know, put in the work in decades really of doing deep research on topics. And what we're talking about here today is one of these original researchers of an entire theory of what motivates us to do better and what motivates us to become our best. And I was a little like, um, I don't know, I was a little apprehensive or I was a little shy when I first booked this interview because I felt like, oh my God, I'm meeting this guy who's mm. done this incredible work. Yeah. And and it's so funny, you and I talk about this all the time, but how you see yourself is not the same as how other people see you, almost always, right? We have our own neuroses and insecurities in our head. And so, uh, Dr. Ryan and I, we, we get on and we start chatting on Zoom because everything in the world is on Zoom now. And uh, he's actually from Rochester, New York. So he's like, tune in there. And we got connected on that level. And then as we started talking, I noticed myself pulling these gems out of him that maybe 
because I'm not in academia anymore, he doesn't get asked these questions that much because he's talking to other academics where it's pretty dry. Right. And I'm not going to tell you what they are because I want him to deliver it to you. But there are three hacks that we talk about in this episode that if you can employ in your life will almost eliminate your suffering and pain mm. and make you so much happier in everyday life. And so check those out. They're like the second half. Well, don't, don't fast forward. Check <laughs> them out in the interview. He's, he's got so much wisdom. And we have so many exciting things coming up with Ignited. So many exciting things. Um, some of the things we can share, some of the things we can't, what we can share is we are expanding our team. We are, we have a uh, new groups, yep. our friend, Alexandra, Alex Pullen, healthy ballerina, whatever you know her by, uh, has been our friend forever and um, yoga teacher, breath work. Um, she's doing a new group for us every Friday and it's we're all, really, really excited yep, about that. It's all about embodiment. So definitely check that out. It's on Fridays. Um, and you can, can you drop in on classes groups? So what we have is, and we'll have a link for you guys. We have two weeks free. Great. So you can join, get all 10 groups. We have 10 groups already. Uh, we can, you can get all of them for two weeks, test it out. If you start after that, you get into our full program and you start paying. So that's one thing. Um, and I'm, what's that monthly? It's one ninety nine a month for everything that we so offer. So that's like, ten times four. That's forty groups. Forty groups for under. It's five dollars a group. Five dollars a group. Five dollars. So you don't have to leave your own home. Nope. Right on your cell phone. Right on your computer. You can be in your pajamas, and we have a whole range. It's not just. For recovery. Oh, it's, it's crazy. We have relationships. Two, trauma, two trauma groups, two relationship groups. By the way, I'm going to take, and you're going to join me on some of these. I'm going to take over one of the relationship groups a few times a month. Yep. Um, family groups. Just so much exciting stuff. These groups alone are life-changing. I sat in on a couple groups last month and was bawling for myself, for the others in the group. It's just such a beautiful sense of community, especially now when we're all needing that. So definitely check out these groups, check out the free two weeks and yeah. where do they go for that? We'll put it in the show notes, but what's the link? We will have, it's a bit.ly link and it's ignited all caps online chats. Um, and so the O in online and the C in chats is capitalized. Okay. You'll see it below, but ignited online chats is a, the bit.ly link for this. And we've been waiting to announce this forever. We had that family program that we ran live a few months ago. And it should now be ready either now or within a week of this coming out pretty much. It should be ready for any of you who either have family members who are struggling with addiction or if you're the one struggling with addiction, you're banging your head against a wall trying to explain to your family members that that old ridiculous model that everybody's trying to use just doesn't work for you. And they're looking at you like, well, you're you're the one who has a problem. This program is the program for them, and it's now available to uh, share. And yeah. there's nothing like it out there. He's been formulating this and ha been really inspired. He Adi works a lot with the families. Like, yes, he works with people that are struggling with different types of substances and behaviors in their life and struggling. But then what about the families? Because without the family, it's almost impossible for someone to truly heal and <laughs> become a whole person again. Totally. That's a problem with so many of these rehabs, right? You go, literally, I'm dealing with a family right now. Over $100,000 paid in a few months. Mm. None of the rehabs delivered what they promised. You can't get your money back. And now they're coming out and they're so jaded um, because they weren't included. The family wasn't involved. Nobody really talked to them at all. You know, things that were promised weren't uh, weren't handed out. Literally in terms of therapies, it's so it's just oh, the nastiest yeah. industry. So we're here to help change that without you having to spend anything near $100,000. Yeah. That's kind of the whole point. Yeah. And check any of that out. Um, We're excited. Really we, excited about it. Excited with you. Please make sure you tag us with any aha moments from this episode. We're so excited. I actually have to go back and listen to it because I wasn't here for this. This was originally taped for our Friday recovery podcast. But it but was so good. It's so good. We wanted to put it on Wednesday. So I'm going to go listen to it right now. You guys let us know what your aha moments are. And be sure to leave a review. Just take an extra 10 seconds and leave us a review. We so appreciate it. Mwah. Bye. This episode of the Ignited Podcast is brought to you by Philosophy Superfoods. The Philosophy offers cleanses and other nutritional products that are unlike any of the other supplements and detoxification programs on the market. Why? Because they actually nourish the body with whole, live, nutrient-rich foods instead of depriving you and leaving you hungry. Have you ever tried a cleanse only to find out that you can't make it through a whole day because you're starving? 
Ever try a superfood shake that made you nauseous because it was so disgusting you'd rather not eat? The philosophy fix all that with a simple set of offerings that load up your body with nutrients while actually tasting good. Makes sense, right? Each of the philosophy superfood and protein blends is vegan, raw, gluten-free, and has absolutely no filler ingredients. With over 15,000 satisfied customers, including some of the world's biggest celebrities like George Clooney, Gerard Butler, Leah Michelle, and over 10 years of experience, this is the best stuff you can get. To buy some or find out more info, go to our website, thephilosophy.com. So thank you so much for doing this. I'm I'm really excited about having you on because I learned about self-determination theory, not in school. I learned about it while doing research for a workshop I was doing for our users. Um, And the workshop was going to focus on human motivation and needs. Um, A lot of the work, most of the work that I do has to do with addiction. And I work in a field, and we talk about it quite a bit on this podcast, where you know, people have sort of decided to focus on the symptom of the problem, i.e. people's drinking, using, etc., and decide that that is the thing that needs to be fixed, right? And if only they could stop drinking, using, or whatever it is that they're doing to, um, to deal with life, then they would be better and everything would work out. I completely disagree with that notion. And I think that what has to be solved are the underlying reasons. And so I said, okay, well, let's you know, I come, my, my PhD is in psychology with behavioral neuroscience emphasis. And, and so that disease model of the brain, et cetera, is, is very prevalent in that world. And I said, if I believe what I believe, which is this is actually a human motivation and needs issue, which is, I'm not the only person espousing that by any stretch, then I better look very deeply into needs and motivation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody, everybody listening right now, everybody who's paying attention probably knows Maslow's hierarchy of needs pyramid, which is sort of, would you agree that's kind of the entry point into uh, when you talk about human needs, that's sort of the first thing people throw out at you? It's the first thing that would pop up on the web. It would be the first thing that people would throw out at you. And it's in every introductory psychology textbook, I think, below yes, pyramid. Exactly. And we learn in psychology as well. And so, I, of course, I started there and I went deeper and deeper and deeper. And then I found um, the self-determination theory and your work with, um, with Dr. Desi. And it was really empowering to find additional theories about human motivation. I incorporated that into my own little hybrid theory, but I wanted to hear from you about what was it that even pulled you originally into diving in so deeply into the topic of human motivation, what drives people, what, I guess, in, in the easiest way to say it so everybody understands, like, what makes people tick? Mm-hmm. Well, the, uh, you know, for me, I'm a clinical psychologist. And so uh, I started my own work as a psychotherapist trying to help people change. And most of the work that was out there and change techniques that were around at the time were really about how you could manipulate the environment, control people with reinforcements, push people around with rewards and punishments, uh, train them to do be different than they were, have them think differently, things that all came from the outside toward the person. And I never really felt like those were effective. Uh, I always felt like, you know, if I could get the sense from inside the person, what were the issues, what was going on, we'd have a much better uh, map of where the obstacles and uh, barriers were to change. Mm. And so I was really trying to take a different point of view on how can we understand motivation from the inside rather than how can we manipulate it from the outside. And yeah. I think that led us on a long chain of both research and practice. It's you know, really kind of taken us a different route than what was around at the time. Love it. Yeah. So let's, let's just dig into that, right? You were saying different route than what was around at the time. One of the biggest aspects of self-determination theory is this concept of where's the motivation to act coming from. And that's something I'm huge on. I mean, the name of our company is Ignited. And the reason it's Ignited is our the way we see our goal is actually to ignite people's purpose, right? 
in the context of self-determination theory, the way I see that is when you get into intrinsic motivation. It's not even, it's not external at all. It, it's, it, it's coming from within, right? Like you don't have to persuade somebody to uh, drink water or, uh, or have a piece of cake oftentimes, right? Because their body, their brain has already fully configured itself and is saying, this is something I truly want. Uh, and, sim- and similarly, you know, if you think about kids being active, kids wanting to play, kids wanting to go outside, kids wanting to explore, you don't have to make them do any of those things. That comes from their natural propensities. Yeah. And I think we were really interested early on in, in what are humans' natural propensities. And, you know, basically, in, in our view, people are curiosity animals. We want to know mm. about the world. We want to understand things. We want to learn. We want to grow. We want to connect. Those are things that people naturally want to do. So that motivation's already there. We don't have to implant that. We mostly have to remove the obstacles yeah. from those that are happening. And, uh, and I see that as you know, the big job of, of clinicians a lot is removing obstacles, not so much supplying motivation. It's uncovering the things that are in the way of that motivation that's already there. Wow. Okay. I'm just going to write obstacles because there's so much I want to get into that, but I don't want to take you off the explanation first. Let's even explain to people what self-determination theory is, right? Um, and so you guys developed this kind of idea of a, of a continuum from fully externalized um, motivation. I don't care about it at all. Um, I don't want it to even happen. And so I'm going to be apathetic and probably not do anything to drive that forward all the way to, like I mentioned, intrinsic motivation. I want this. It flows from within me. Can you walk people through the different stages of that? Uh, I'm going to ask you later, kind of, how did you even come up with those different levels? Because that's always interesting to me. But can you walk people through that really quickly? Sure. When you think about any any behavior that you ask people to do, let's say it's you know attend a, a psychotherapy therapy session or take out the garbage, whatever the particular behavior might be, people can have a lot of different reasons for doing it. Uh, first of all, like you said, some people might not have any reason for doing it. So, you know, you say, come to the psychotherapy session. Some people say, nah, it doesn't matter to me and I don't care. And they don't show up or they show up, but they don't participate. Some people, though, might be motivated to come because they're afraid of sanctions or rewards. You know, so sometimes people put uh, rewards or punishments on to doing it. So, you know, a, a VA clinic might say to a, a client, you know, you'll lose your benefits if you don't do X. Okay, well, they might not want to lose benefits, so they do the X, but they don't want to do it. And there's no volition or willingness in it. So we call that external regulation. So that's kind of the lowest level of motivation, which is I'm doing it, but I don't want to. And I'm doing it because you're making me do it or because you've got a carrot or a stick that's driving me yeah and you know people will act from carrots and sticks if i got a big enough stick i can get people to jump if i've got a sweet enough carrot you can get people to act the the issue is that it's not a very high quality motivation people don't care about the behavior they only care about the outcome and as soon as the carrot and the stick go away so does the behavior so it doesn't last over time and that's why it's a poor quality motivation yeah none of us want a worker who only wants to be there because otherwise they won't get paid. <laughs> you know, that's not the, it's not the excited work we want. Yeah. yeah. And this speaks a little bit to the reason why, you know, telling your kids, if you get a really good grade, I'll give you a very big prize. Right. Actually does the opposite of what a lot of parents think that it does, which is it makes the value of education or makes the value of studying hard on a test. Um, not the success in the, topic area, but rather the reward you get afterwards. And so it can, it can create, sometimes we can even create these circumstances that lean heavily on external motivation, even when there could be some internal motivation at play. That's right. Yeah. We say that kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I motivate everybody around me with carrots and sticks, then people around me only respond when I pull out the stick or bring out the carrot. Yeah, so, so true. in a way it creates the, the very circumstance that people expect. Yeah, you know, just to kind of continue on this continuum, though, um, you know, there's that's external regulation that's pretty low quality. People can also do things not because they're being pressured by the environment to do it, but because they pressure themselves. So, mm-hmm. 
know, some people do what we call introjection, which is they beat themselves up if they don't do something well, or they drive themselves because they have to look good in other people's eyes. So there's motivation there, but it's a very stressful kind of motivation, a lot of personal cost to it. Uh, and again, it's kind of fragile motivation because once you start to fail, uh, when you're under that kind of pressure, then it's really easy to get up, give up and get depressed. Yeah. I know that motivation. Well, I grew up and I know a lot of people, you know, if you have parents who are kind of really hard driving, you end up mm -hmm. internalizing that requirement for success. I was just talking to some guys about this a few months ago. My, my father is now passed, but for years after he even passed the, that, 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 kind of fatherly voice of, Hey, you're not working hard enough. You're not doing enough. You're not succeeding enough can stay there. And that's the signal that you've internalized that external pressure. Right. Um, exactly. but, but it's still not the desire to do well or the payoff of what I get internally from doing well. It's still acquiescing to this voice of an external motivator in your head. Yeah. We say, you know, you're obeying the I should rather than the I want. Hmm. And that kind of gives us to the next level of a much higher quality, quality of motivation is when you do something because you know it's important or you know it's worthwhile. So I'm coming to work not just because I don't want to lose the paycheck or just because I, you know, I, I feel like I should do better, but I'm coming to work because I know my work matters, uh, that what I'm doing is, uh, has a value, it, it is of merit in its own right. And so I'm wanting to be at work. I'm wanting to accomplish the things that I'm doing there. And that's a very high quality motivation. People are full heartedly into it in that case. Um, and that's what you really want to be cultivating. And then there's the intrinsic motivation that you spoke of before, which is when you do something because it's fun and it's interesting. And of course, that's also a high, what we call autonomy motivation, something you're doing with a high degree of willingness. Mm. And so, you know, kind of in a nutshell, self-determination there is really focused on how can you help people be at the either intrinsically motivated or identified level of wanting to do what they're doing versus be feeling pushed around by external forces or internal shoulds and having their behavior come from that stuff. I love it. And, and then when people are really acting from volition and willingness, they also have a much more positive experience of life yeah. and they have higher well-being. And so that's also a part of our work is how can you foster that? I love it. And that's, in the end, that's what matters, right? We're all trying to enjoy this process. We're here for whatever limited amount of time we're here for. Uh, it's going to pass. We want the time in the middle to, to deliver. And that delivery is normally deliver as much happiness as possible and sometimes impact if you care about that. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of different pieces that I want to talk about because the people who listen to this podcast primarily listen either because of relationship issues they're struggling with and or addiction related issues. And so I think in that sense, bringing that together here could be really powerful. And you talked about obstacles. Um, I see obstacles in many, many different places for people to really connect to that intrinsic motivation. Um, and sometimes those, um, those obstacles come in the form of past traumas, past um, indoctrinations into belief structures that don't serve either one's trust that they can deliver, right? That they can do something meaningful or, um, you know, sometimes just there, I talk a lot about shame. We, we kind of talk about F shame quite a bit in, in this uh, podcast. And so these internalized feelings of being less than being unworthy, et cetera. I see those as, as really big obstacles and I'll call them, internalized obstacles. Can you talk a little bit as you guys do this, have done this work, are still doing this work, have researched, what have you found blocks people from progressing along that line of moving towards more and more intrinsic motivation for success and action in life? Well, you know, a lot of different things can move people along there. Sometimes, you know, as a clinician, you see people because they have gotten stuck, because they're finding themselves really unhappy, because they're not making progress in life, and they come in to kind of try and understand why. And kind of as you said, Adi, sometimes you find that people are living scripts that aren't even their own scripts. Yeah. They're, uh, they're working in a job, or they're pursuing goals or aims that they've never really reflected on before, and they're not really their own. And so they have a hard time or they're struggling at work in, in part because it's not really 
their passion or their interest or what they want to be doing with their lives, but somebody else's idea of what they should have been doing or what they should be doing. So that, that is a source of unhappiness. Sometimes we're stuck in, in past scripts. Um, sometimes it feels like uh, uh, we don't have the skills or don't really know how to get uh, to the next step in something, or we haven't really uh, gotten behind a goal that's there. Um, one of the things that we find a lot is people will often engage in behaviors that may not be the most adaptive, but they're doing it because they're suffering in other places in life. Yeah. Like one of the things we see a lot with addiction is, you know, people will be pretty motivated to uh, drink or take drugs, particularly if that's a place they can find some satisfaction and they're not finding it anywhere else in life. Yeah. We call yeah. this the new density hypothesis. It's not, you know, because there are some things that get fulfilled when you take drugs or drink. Sure. There are some satisfactions there. If those start to outweigh the satisfactions you can find elsewhere in your life, they become pretty strong gravitational pull. Totally. And, and especially, you know, you mentioned people getting stuck. I think this is actually something we can talk about in general. We live in a society that measures success by so many external metrics how much money do you make? What car do you drive? How big is your house? What clothes do you have and how much do they cost? You know, what class do you travel in when you fly? All those sorts of things. And I've worked, I'm sure you have as well, but I've worked with people who are worth more money than I'm probably going to ever see in my life, right? Like in the billions and are absolutely miserable, right? And, and that's why to me, when I was trying to work on this concept of needs and motivation, what was important is, to try to find a language to explain to people, look, you've got to stop chasing that outside stuff. You chasing the outside stuff. Look, in self-determination theory, it's almost a given that if you start chasing the external, externally motivated things, you will have to move more towards external motivation in your life, which means that you've left behind the intrinsic motivation. It's not that you can't make money doing something that you love, but if you make making money the goal of the action, you are moving your behavioral decision based on how much money you make. And we live in a society where I think a lot of people pick the job, pick the career, pick the place to live, pick the partner that fit the externally motivated um, criteria that, that somebody else, by the way, you already talked about the scripting piece. So like somebody else even told them what is supposed to matter. <laughs> they bought into that and then they said, okay, well, let me get the wife that everybody will appreciate. Let me get the house that everybody will appreciate. Let me get the job that will pay me a half a million dollars down the line. And then they find themselves stuck 15, 20, 25 years later. And now it's almost like you have to reel back uh, so many of those decisions sometimes. And you said people aren't even considering them. I wonder to what extent you think that is a, a societal, almost like determinant, right? It's like our society throws you in those boxes. Well, you know, first uh, you're describing a big wing of our work in self-determination theory where we've looked at people's life goals. And we have found over and over again that people who put a priority on those kind of external goals of making money or having a great appearance or having a cool image or becoming famous, they're, they're much more unhappy than people who make their life goals centered around relationships or learning and growth or giving to their communities. And part of the reason for that is, is when you're pursuing money or image, you're typically not satisfying some very basic psychological needs. You're not feeling connected with people. You know, you're not pursuing the things you want to do. You're putting yourself off in a position to be pushed around by the money. So you end up with a life that's just a lot less happy, even when you're successful. So I think what kind of the remarkable thing is, you know, studies show that People who chase money, even when they get it, it doesn't make them happy. Yeah. And uh, I think that's kind of a sad story about our society. You know, if I can just tell you one, you know, quick study. There was Please. a study recently with, with lawyers in the U.S. And the sample was five or 6,000 lawyers. And they divided the lawyers into three groups. One group was a group that uh, was they called uh, social advocacy lawyers, people who went into law because they wanted to help the environment or they wanted to do good or... Uh, you know, um, represent people who are uh, without representation, that kind of goal. And then they had another group that they called the money lawyers, the people who went into law so that they could make big bucks, you know, hedge fund operators and uh, people who are trying to help people with tax evasion and issues like that, but just generally in it for the money. Um, 
And then there was a third group that was kind of a mixed group. And then they looked at how happy those groups were. And typically, if you studied happiness, you would control for income because there's some positive association between income and happiness. Yeah. And what they found is that if they didn't have to control for income because the money lawyers, even though they made tons more, were much more unhappy mm. than the social advocacy lawyers. And the reason was, of course, the social advocacy lawyers had a purpose every day. They went into work. They wanted to be there. And they had that autonomous motivation that we talked about. But the day-to-day activities of the people getting money were not autonomy. Uh, uh, Driven. They weren't featuring autonomy. They, they were much more likely to be every day doing some things that they had to do to get that big paycheck. Mm. So, you know, they had unhappier lives, even though they were successful at what they aimed for. Yeah. So we say, be careful what you wish for. So. <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> well, you know, I, I live, my wife is, uh, is very big into this concept. She's, I came from science. She came from more spirituality and, and sort of like the, woo -woo sciences and uh she always talks about manifestation and you know manifestation is this concept of once you think about what you want and you really visualize it well and you have a sense of where you're going you're probably going to get it just be careful of what it is that you visualize and decided you want because if what i'm hearing what you're saying is if what you focus on is that you really want the money your decision will start your decision making in life will start basing itself on well, what will make the most money? Because it doesn't really matter what the task is. If all you want is to have a hundred million dollars in the bank account, then you will do the thing that asks that provides you with more money, regardless of how connected you are to it, because it delivers that, you know, the dollar yeah. sign. Um, okay, I love it, and if it's okay, I want to dig in again. Please do. I, I do a lot of work in addiction and in relationships. Um, addiction treatment, and this is something I'm trying to change, but addiction treatment in general rests itself on, on persuading people that they are not autonomous when it comes to their addiction. And I'm not talking even just about their dependency on a specific substance, but rather that there's something in their brain that has become maladapted or there's something in their genetics that were created initially um, they were maladaptive or due to repeated use, they've, they've somehow altered their, themselves or this phrase, you know, you can't turn a pickle back into a cucumber. I've mm -hmm. always read it and I struggled with my own addiction back in the day, pretty heavy duty meth addiction and alcohol and weed. So it was, it was serious. Uh, and I don't any, any longer, but that always troubled me that in trying to help somebody, one of the way stations, one of the stops they have to get on on the way to being quote unquote better is to make a determination that they're powerless, that they have lost autonomy. Whereas I see the goal and I see this in self-determination theory all over is to actually let people connect deeply to the, to the power they hold within because this whole conversation of motivation, it's, it's a mind game, right? It's about, I could have the exact same circumstances. And I tell this to my clients all the time. You could have the exact same job in the exact same relationship, have everything else look the same on the outside. And if you find a way to connect to the purpose, connect to a deeper why, understand the intrinsic motivation, the, the real reasons why you're engaged in this, you can completely shift your level of contentment with the exact same um, external circumstances. And mm -hmm. I see any, honestly, and this is my bias and I get it. So I want to put it in front of a, a researcher who's been doing this work for, for years so that maybe there's some holes in it. I see almost anything that tells a person, well, look, um, you're powerless or you, you, you are unable to control your thoughts. You are unable to control your actions as um, doing great harm to their potential to find the right path for them because essentially it kind of it writes in some built-in damage to the system so mm -hmm. that's just my bias i don't know how you feel about it <clears throat> well a couple of things you know sometimes when i've heard that treatment philosophy it usually also accompanies a kind of treatment that's going to try and do things to people to get them to change yeah and uh and you know it's really not the approach to treatment i've ever uh endorsed or used myself so 
uh, you know, my own way. And it's trying to understand the frame of reference of the person that I'm with really deeply trying to understand what is it that you think about your own addiction? Mm. Why are you here? Um, and so, you know, sometimes if it's, if they're there for the wrong reasons, you know, they're there because the court mandates it. they're, they're there because other people are making them do it. I'm interested in their lack of motivation. I'm not punitive about it, not saying you, should, you, you need to be motivated yourself. It's more like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious that it's coming from the other people rather than from you. Tell me about that. Yeah. I'm interested in why it is that they're not feeling that. And usually what you find out is it's not that people aren't motivated to change. It's that they have their own barriers and obstacles, and you have to find out what those are. Yeah. They have their own fears. They have their own issues that are going on around change. And unless we get into those things, we're not going to see any permanent and sustained change happen. I love and it. And so you know, I think I trust people to be able to, in an honest place, talk about themselves and grapple with their own existence. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's important to the process of change. Yeah, there's so much in it, right? I mean... I know when I, when I train professionals, sometimes I tell them, look, if you really believe that the person in front of you is unable to make proper decisions, if you really believe that they are damaged, you have to go into another field. Um, yeah. Because yeah. if you don't believe the person in front of you can create change and take control of their life, you probably can't be the person to help them get there. Yeah. You yeah. know, because no, I, you... It's really helping to catalyze... Again, that motivation that we have within us, everybody wants to grow. Everybody would like to be well. Everybody would like to connect. But we have mm -hmm. to find out if they're not, what's in the way? I love what's that. Going? I love that. I, um, when I look into the research on self-determination theory, often it seems to take place within workplaces um, or kind of what made, motivates employees to, to do things, et cetera. Um, I would love to shift to that to some extent because I do find in the people I work with that oftentimes it is people's work that is one of those obstacles. Have you found that? Well, I think people, a lot of people, well, if you think about it, we're spending uh, most of us 40 hours or more a week in work. If work is miserable, life is miserable. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, no work matters a lot. And it's a lot of people think of work as the thing they do to live, but if that's the way you're living, and it's a good part of your life that uh, is, is simply something you're trying to get through. And I, yeah. I, do, I do think, you know, work creates stressors too that people carry over into their lives and invades every nook and cranny of their existence. And, it does. I mean, uh, you know, most of us think about work after work as well. Um, I want to say by the same thing about school though. I mean, mm. one, of the, one of my peeves around <laughs> education and schools is children are human beings and that's their life. That's a lot of their life is spent there. And if we spend that time making them miserable or putting them under constant pressure and taking away the joy of learning, we're also hurting their lives for so many years. And so That's just true. like work, these things that are so important, they should be positive atmospheres. They can be positive atmospheres. There's yeah. no reason to make them into miseries. That's so true. My kids go to Waldorf schools yeah. partially for that reason, to incorporate play, incorporate more outdoor um, engagement and, and, and imagination instead of this kind of rote memorization that I was part of in public education so much, you know, when I know just, where you went to school, so I, I know how hard driving they are there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's so funny. I, um, you know, when it comes, you mentioned work and again, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Really, I took away from the work theme. I just, was going no, over no, 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 it's all good. I think, I think look for kids, Work, school is their work, right? That's like their job. It's the yeah, same it's thing. Job. So I think, I think that's a great point. It reminds me of the story. I, I run these groups online for some of our uh, participants around addiction. And, and once a week, I, I go on a theme and people get to ask questions. And so this woman on one of those um, hour-long groups was saying, hey, I'm doing the work in the program, but I'm still drinking. I'm not really sure why. Can you help me work through it? And the first question I asked her, and it speaks to some of what we're talking about, is, well, if you had to name the three most stressful things in your life right now, what would they be? And she had to think about it for a minute. And she said, and she was typing this on the chat. That's a nice thing about online help because she didn't have to reveal herself and talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she wrote, my job, my relationship with my husband, and my children. And without being facetious and, and cynical, 
I, I kind of started laughing. I said, I know exactly why you're not stopping drinking. You just described something close to 100% of your life. Yeah. When I asked you the question of what are the three most stressful things in your life? And I said, I don't know what is stressing your body to those and we need to go into them. But if 100% of your life is creating stress, you will find a way to, this is that intrinsic motivation, you will find a way to be okay with all of that. And that will require coping of some sort. You know, I, I would even put it to, if, if we don't have places in our lives where we get to experience autonomy, where we get to experience being effective and confident, and we don't get to experience connection and relationships, we are suffering. And that's a big predictor of people's substance use. Yeah. Is that you, aren't getting, you aren't getting your basic psychological needs satisfied. You're not engaged in the kind of activities and lifestyle and relationships that are helping you be well. Yep. And if you can't be well, then you're going to you know, gravitate to things that make you feel good in the short term. Love it. So you just mentioned the three factors, and I want to jump into those real quick. Um, in, my, in my sort of like hybrid theory, your guys' autonomy, competence, and, and uh, community or connection in some way, uh, I, I put them inside of a glass. <laughs> and I was saying like, the, these things are the, the fluid that fills your glass. Um, the more competence you experience, the more you feel like what you do matters and people appreciate it and you're good at it, the, the better off you are. You guys talk obviously about community as well. The more connected you are through those endeavors, the better off you are. And you guys talked about autonomy. I called it control because I made it three C's. Um, mm -hmm. competence, control, and community. But um, again, I'm, I'm going back to that aspect of people feeling like they're in control of their life really speak to the motivation that we mentioned earlier. Would you say, you know, that there are like, in all, in all the work and all the research you guys have done, are there tricks? Are there hacks? Are there shortcuts? Are there ways that you found that allow people who feel, let's say, out of control and lacking in autonomy to to help themselves feel more connected to where they are in control or competence, right? Competence is a big one for us, right? Because you can be, what I try to explain to people is you can be really competent. We talked about jobs that make you a lot of money. You can be incredibly competent at something and make a lot of money on it. But if your motivation is not focused on your competence, but instead of focus on the money, again, yeah. we're missing the point. So when you guys look at these three factors, what are some big contributors to increase satisfaction and happiness that you found? Well, you know, first, you know, you said are there shortcuts. I think there's no real shortcuts in life in, in this sense. I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, this is, there's not a thing you can go do tomorrow and then life will suddenly improve. But, you know, I think one thing that's, that's really key for everybody in life is a relationship where you can talk and be honest and open with somebody. Mm. I think everybody needs that. And part of the reason that relationships are so important to us is that they're, they're part of getting all of our needs satisfied. If I have a really good friend who I can talk to, that's also where I get to discover where things are hurting, where there are the things that I don't want to be doing. What, you know, so in other words, I can even work on my autonomy and my competence, but I, I can do that with a friend and feel support and feel heard in some way. So you know, I think you know, a number one thing is, is finding that person, a person in life that you can feel open and comfortable with and talk to honestly. I think it's huge and important. I love that. And I love that you brought it into, because we talk a lot about intimate relationships, that you brought it not just into intimate relationships, but relationships writ large. So that speaks to the community and the connection in your model anyway. But you said something about being honest. And we talk, my wife and I, um, we talk a lot in, on this podcast about radical transparency. Mm -hmm. um, we are big proponents of moving one level beyond even honesty, right? You don't have to wait for people to ask you a question that they know to ask you <laughs> in order to provide honest feedback. But I want people to get to a place where they can be as authentic as possible with their close intimate connections anyway, and share things that are maybe hidden deep inside from the rest of the world, especially around those pain points. Um, and so you just talked about, I think, I think when you do that too, you discover your own pain points. Sometimes we're not even aware of like how, difficult something is for us or how much something's in the way for us until we start to express it and talk about it in that transparent way. So, I love your radical transparency idea. 
Um, I think it's, uh, we, you know, we have a, a mini theory in our work that's called relationship motivation theory. And we say, you really don't have intimacy with somebody you can't be honest with. You don't have intimacy with someone who's going to judge, control, or conditionally regard you. Those are, mm. not, those are not the people you go to in no. times of trouble or in times of joy. Those are not the people you want to share your emotions with. Uh, you, you want the ear of somebody who's not judgmental and, and who cares about you. So true. And it goes both ways, right? I mean, if I'm holding back my transparency, my, my true self from somebody else, I'm not even allowing them to be in relationship with me. Um, they're now in relationship with some projected image that I've decided to create for them. And, and when I deal with couples, that's actually one of the biggest issues is people who've been holding on to either resentments, but maybe not even resentments, rather elements of themselves, some of their internalized thinking, ways that they see the world perspectives on the world that they felt unsafe in sharing. And, and therefore it's almost like they're, you know, 80% of them is in relationship with their loved one, not, not a hundred percent. And that can create conflict because you're not even giving your loved one an opportunity to judge who you are. You're not even, you're not, you don't trust them enough to be fully in that relationship. Yeah. I, I agree. I think, you know, if we can characterize what really makes for a high quality relationship, it, it is that transparency, it is that trust. And that comes about because, in fact, you listen with an open ear and you're not judgmental of the other person. And, uh, you know, you, you try and understand their perspective as their perspective. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a big element. Yeah. So, you know, I think relationships is the first thing I go to when you say, well, what makes people well? I think uh, a transparent and trusting relationship, number one on that thing. I love it. I, I mean, I, I love it not only because it falls into the work that we do here, but it, it, it might not be a hack, but that's, that's up to you though, right? Like that's something anybody listening right now can change immediately. Right. I just wrote an email. It's so uh, apropos that we're talking about this. I wrote an email to our list. Just, I think it went out today. Um, and I gave him a challenge. I said, take something you haven't told somebody close to you. Make it meaningful enough so that it matters when you bring it up. And it's not like, hey, the other day I told you I had one cup of coffee and I had two. Right. Don't make it that because that's silly and it's not going to, it's not going to deliver the point. Take something that is meaningful enough when you say it to them, you're risking a little bit of intimacy capital, right? There's, they're going to have a reaction to it. Write it down. Pick the time you're going to say it to them. If you need a professional or a peer to kind of practice how you're going to say it to them, that's fine. But then go and do the hard work of revealing it to them. Yeah. And after that's done and after that conversation is done, take stock of how much relief you actually experienced from taking this little nugget that you've been holding on to. So it's really, I think it's not a hack per se, but it goes back to what I was saying before, which is we do have a lot of power, yeah. a lot of control within our own lives to change our perspective and our engagement in what already exists and make it better, make it produce more happiness and contentment for us. You know, if I can go for another hack or another Please. human strategy, you know, I think the autonomy piece is huge. And, you know, when we don't have autonomy, when we feel like we're being pushed around or the things we're doing are a chain of have tos every day, and nobody can really be well if that's dominating their life. So all of us have to find those areas of life where we're doing something that we really value or find interest in. And it may not be work because not all of us have the privilege of a job where you know, we can fulfill our purpose and things like that. But if we don't have it there, then we have to find it somewhere else. We have to find that sense of purpose and meaning in activities that are, that are in our life. So that could be an, a hobby, an avocation, a sport, a community adventure, a, a thing that you, you know, a volunteer activity. But, you know, everybody needs a thing that they do because they want to, that I, you know, because I want to. And that, that is vitalizing in life. So when we think about the energy and spark people have, it comes about because they've got a passion. I love it. And so I think identifying a passion, where after you identify the good relationship, <laughs> identify the passion and start pursuing it, you know, however you can. Yeah. And sometimes that can be something that's really simple. Like you love painting and it gives you freedom. And so instead of just running around doing nothing on Saturday, you dedicate three hours a week to taking a piece of canvas or taking whatever it is you could draw on, going to a park, going somewhere and just 
engaging in that. And, and even as I'm even saying those words, the first thing that comes up for me is going back to listening to that in, intrinsic voice, right? Um, it, it goes back to what you were just saying, which is we get to, we get to put emphasis on the whys or the, the what we do. We, we have some control in where we point our attention. And so if you, if you have to work a job where you're a cashier and you know, greeting people and smiling at them is just not a big enough why for you, then that's fine. What I'm hearing you say is don't, put, don't spend all your day talking about how your job doesn't serve you. Literally spend the same time that you would spend complaining about the elements that are not serving your intrinsic needs. Spend that exact same time focusing on something that does fulfill you and feed you. Absolutely. Yeah. I love you know, it. Uh, you said something else that just brings me to a third hack, if you will. There you go. Um, and it has to do with mindfulness. So mm-hmm. a lot of our work uh, recently in SDT has been how do people find their volition? And it really comes back to something that I, I like your words for, it, which is you have to listen. And in this case, you have to listen to yourself. Yeah. So you've got to tune in. You've got to tune in to the, the, the pains, the, uh, the agonies, the frustrations, and those things. Identify them, not, not in uh, uh, any other way than just being able to give a label to the things that you see going on that are, are not working for you and the things that are. So that you can be aware of where should I point that attention. Yeah. And where is it that I'm you know, standing in the muck? Mm. And I think, uh, I think we think cultivating that capacity just to pay attention to yourself and to pay attention to the moment and what's going on in it is really helpful in terms of finding your autonomy and finding your relationships with other people. So true. We live, we live in a culture that will gi- always give you new ways to distract yourself from listening. <laughs> yeah. You know, reality TV or video games or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is, but something that will just draw your attention so you don't have to look inward. And I think sometimes it is because as we talked about earlier, people have picked routes that they're not incredibly satisfied with. So the voices inside are not always happy and cheery. Sometimes they, they need distraction all the time because otherwise that stuff's going to come up. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I feel like we could continue this conversation for 45 years. Um, I would, I'd like that. I think it's a nice conversation. Yeah. Well, <laughs> nice to hear your sentiments on this because I, you know, I do think, especially in the fields that uh, you work in a lot and uh, uh, addiction and alcohol issues. Uh, we see a lot of outside in techniques and not enough. I think of let's find out who we are. So true. How we got here and where we're going. And uh, Well, I love that we got to connect. I, I literally, I mean, literally the way I came up with this is I um, was doing my research for this workshop I did. And obviously I, and I started going pretty deep into some literature about self-determination theory <laughs> And then, you know, doing, at least in academia, I learned it never hurts to ask. So I just sent out emails to both of you and I said, Hey, can we, can we just get you directly on? So thank you so much for coming on. Um, where can people find your work? What, what are the places if people are interested in this, interested in learning more, interested in how to apply this into their, their lives? You guys have done a lot of work on this. So where's the best place to go? So there's a, a website, um, selfdeterminationtheory.org. So you just do self-determination theory is one word, dot org. You get there. You just look up a self-determination theory on the web, though. You'll, you'll find it. And the website has a lot of free resources. It has papers you can download and uh, films you can watch, lectures you can watch. Uh, there's a free course uh, on self-determination theory that you can link up through the website. So that's the bit place I would go. Um, you can get a lot of resources there on all of these topics. Love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan, for, uh, for spending this time with us. Um, and thank you for finding those three hacks, even as we talked about originally, and there were no hacks. So we got some. Um, for those of you who are paying attention right now, just go back. I mean, we talked about this a lot in here, but just remember that oftentimes we talked about scripts. We're all walking around reading from a book that's supposed to tell us how to be happy and how not to be. And unfortunately, it was given to us by other people who are, yeah, they're trying to do their best, but maybe didn't have exactly the right, um, the right tools in their own pockets. And so it's always okay to re-script and, and change that original book and, and put some edits in. And I think self-determination theory can give a lot of, a lot of us new tools into that. So 
look up selfdeterminationtheory.org, check out their work. Uh, it's really powerful. And you can also check out our Ultimate Bliss Blueprint um, workshop that I did, which is based uh, partially on uh, self-determination theory. So if this connected for you, please share it with us. Are you on social media, Dr. Ryan, at all? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Facebook, we have a STT Facebook page and uh, uh, the Twitter and uh, you know, so any, all kinds of ways. Uh, also LinkedIn. Love it. So. so tag them and let us know what really resonated. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you all so much. Have a great weekend. See you next week. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Ignited Podcast. We were so happy to have you along for this ride. Please go and subscribe to this. Leave us a review. We love hearing from you. And if you want more, don't forget to go to ignited.com where all the podcast episodes are available with show notes and so many of the little details and links from each one of these interviews. And you can look at all the future events that we have going on, all the things that make Ignited so special, even beyond this recording. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next week.